Good morning. Welcome to the uh, morning session uh, on the topic of hope. I'm uh, Professor Derek Jeffries from the University of Wisconsin, uh, Green Bay. Uh, in addition to my presentation, uh, Professor Joseph Seifert will be uh, presenting and commenting, and then we will follow that with uh, Professor uh, Michael Huey. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different than some of what we've done before. Uh, because it's going to be somewhat applied, meaning I'm, my work is in how personalism bears on some political questions. I've been working for many years on um, violence and questions related to violence and uh, our penal system. And so I'm interested in what personalism can teach us. I think it can teach us a great deal. Um, so that's really what I'm going to be focusing on with some theory, but particularly uh, uh, on, uh, a little bit more focused. So as I mentioned to some of you, I uh, have been a lecturer, a volunteer lecturer, in some of Wisconsin's prisons and jails for, at this point, almost a decade. And this work has been very transformational, um, both spiritually and academically. That transformation began for me when I wrote a book on solitary confinement. And I continue to write about that topic. Um, but that was really a big change in how I looked at our um, prison system. And last year, I wrote a book on our jail system, not our prison system, but our jail system, uh, where I used the work of Dietrich von Hildebrand um, to look at how we perceive the dignity of, of the human person, or don't perceive it. That was what I was particularly uh, interested in. And when I was doing that uh, work, one of the issues that I confronted sadly, was the problem of mental illness in our jail system. About 13% of men uh, suffer from what's called severe mental illness, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar depression, deep depression. And what's really shocking is about twice that number of women, about 30% of women in our jail suffer from the same kind of uh, diseases. And when you meet people who are suffering from these uh, difficulties, um, it's very painful, and many of them do not have a lot of hope. They don't um, uh, think that their lives are really worth very much. And what's even more disturbing to me is the problem seems particularly hopeless. Um, a lot of people, when they hear about this, say, well, we need to spend more money on our mental health system, or we need to open up our uh, old mental institutions, and none of these is a particularly sound uh, solution to the problem. So having confronted this in a book, really not offering any kind of um, solutions, honestly, I decided that I should work on the, on the topic of hope, because it's a deep and, and, and difficult uh, issue. So I want to begin uh, with a definition of hope. It's from uh, Joseph Pieper. Some of you know his work. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on the details of that, because I want to tie hope to a topic that we've discussed in the seminar already, and that's the type, uh, topic of subjectivity, or the word uh, Eigenleben. And uh, the question I want to pose here is, what happens to a person's hope if she has a stigmatized subjectivity? Uh, and I'm going to give you some concrete examples I find in phenomenology and in philosophy in general. It's good to work with some very specific examples to really wrestle with. So I'm going to offer you some very specific examples of people who are stigmatized and really struggling. And um, what kind of hope do they have? Then I'm going to offer you one example, a positive example, I think, of one way a person might be able to get out of this kind of uh, stigmatized uh, situation. And finally, I'm going to conclude by asking, uh, why should we even care about this? The people I'm going to talk to you about are um, difficult people, to say the least. Some of them are very violent. And often people say, why should we care about them? And I want to make a plea uh, to consider uh, the lives of these people in our prison system. So let's begin with Joseph Pieper. Uh, he wrote two books on hope, one in the 1930s and one in the 1960s. Bernard Schumacher, who is a scholar of, of Pieper, points out some interesting differences between these two works. The initial work is very Thomistic, and it uh, really presents a Thomistic account of hope as a theological virtue. The second book, which uh, is right here, Hope and History, 
is a, a set of lectures at Salzburg, Pieper doesn't really abandon the initial definition of hope, but what he does is engage a number of different currents of thought, ordinary language philosophy, he starts the book with Kant, and he engages Ernst Bloch, which is interesting. Ernst Bloch was a Marxist not appealing to Pieper, or not appealing to me, to be honest. But he does so in a very generous way. And this is kind of, for me, a, a, an attractive feature of somebody like Josef Pieper, willing to engage views with which he disagrees. And I think that's very uh, a positive. Now, what does Pieper tell us? hope is. Let's think about this definition. Um, hope is an intentional movement toward a future good, difficult but possible to achieve. An intentional movement toward a future good, difficult but possible to attain. As I mentioned, this a lot of this is straight out of, of Thomas, Summa Theologica and other places, so it's not new. Uh, Pieper looks at, though, each element of this definition. And I don't want to do that here because I don't have a lot of time and my interest is elsewhere. But each of those is rather interesting to consider. Possibility is an interesting one. Uh, can we hope for things that really aren't possible? And what does possibility mean? I once uh, talked about hope in our prison. It's a maximum security prison. I did exactly what I did here, just presented the definition. And I deal with a lot of men who are uh, what are called lifers. We have 160,000 people in the United States serving some form of life incarceration. They're not going to get out of prison. And these guys said, what do you mean? I can't put, uh, hope for the impossible. I hope I'm going to be released. And I felt really strange at that moment. I just kind of felt I'm not going to say anything because I'm not going to tell somebody that they shouldn't hope that they should be released. It's, it's uncomfortable, deeply uncomfortable for me. So that issue of possibility, what is the nature? Is it some kind of modal claim? Is it, I mean, there's a lot of interesting questions we could look at the nature of, uh, of possibility. But let's just hold that definition in mind without going through all of the pieces, if people want to challenge um, this, Professor Seifert has written on um, hope in, in, a, in a very instructive way. And you can see that in your packet. His, his book is quite, his essay is quite useful. Uh, let's just hold that definition in mind. Because at a conference like this, I want to link it to um, subjectivity. I was very glad that we had some time to talk about this term that Professor Crosby translates Eigenleben. As he points out, it appears in uh, von Hildebrand's beautiful book, uh, The Nature of Love, a chapter on Eigenleben and Transcendence. Parenthetically, I just taught that book um, in a seminar. I teach at a state university. Uh, my students are mostly um, first-generation college students. Many of them are Catholic, but this was a, a deeply interesting book to them. Once they wrestled with it, it's hard, but once they struggled with this book, it was deeply interesting. I just received our student evaluations, and they all wrote about how interested they were in this text. So it really spoke to them, it speaks to me. So, so this interesting uh, issue of subjectivity or Eigenleben. Uh, Professor Crosby, uh, analyzes this in great detail in his earlier book. Uh, it, it, it appears in his recent book on, on, on Newman, which is an excellent and, and wonderful text. But he really analyzes this in great detail in his uh, earlier book, The Selfhood of the Human Person. All the different sides of subjectivity and self-presence and self-determination and really a recollection, which I think is a, is a really fruitful aspect of, of Eigenleben. And so uh, my, uh, well, my interest here is in what happens if somebody has a sense of their own subjectivity that is broken or uh, despised or hated in some way. Um, but I'd like to read a, a part of uh, the text from John Crosby, because uh, in, in, in doing this, I uh, was um, struck by this particular passage. It's on page 119 of The Selfhood of the Human Person. It's a text that came out with uh, Catholic University Press uh, some years ago. But here's what I'd like to read. Uh, but there is another quite different social dimension of my subjectivity 
Other persons commonly empower me to perform certain acts of subjective freedom, including the most significant of them. The respect shown to me as a person by others enables me to respect myself as a person. Their respect mediates me to myself, empowering me to respect myself. The unconditional acceptance of me by another person or by the entire social milieu in which I live is all important in enabling me to accept myself. If all the significant others in my life refuse to accept me as the self that I am, I will be crippled in my relation to myself. There is more here than an empirical psychological need for confirmation of others. It seems rather that I exist from the roots of my personal being toward others and with others. This is why they play this large role in mediating me to myself. I cannot simply say to those, do not accept the self which I am, you are wrong. I have in reality a self worthy of acceptance. And then proceed to live unimpeded a full self-acceptance, as if they were in error about the date of my birth and I were holding fast to what I know to be the true date. It is rather the case that I exist in such solidarity with them that their rejection of me is a real assault on me. It creates a serious, even not absolutely insuperable, obstacle for my relation to myself. And he then quotes from Martin Buber, very interesting passage. So what he's saying here is that uh, eigenleben or, or subjectivity has a social dimension. I can't just uh, look into the mirror and say, uh, I'm a good guy and everybody likes me and accept me. And we've talked about acceptance. I think John uh, Henry brought in Romano Guardini, which was really quite an interesting uh, concept of accepting yourself and come, recollecting and then accepting uh, oneself. But what happens if nobody accepts me? What happens if I have a stigmatized identity? There was a great sociologist in the 1960s named Irving Goffman, controversial, but a thinker that I really liked, and he wrote a book called Stigma. And in that book, he talks about stigma as a spoiled identity. And as one group of people looks at somebody else and they say, you are disgusting or you are revolting or there's something wrong with you. And what's disturbing is if you are the recipient of that stigma, uh, you may internalize it. Back in the 1960s, there was a debate about something called labeling theory in sociology, controversial theory, but I always thought there was something to it because when you receive a label, particularly young people, Sometimes you internalize that label. Sometimes you accept what other people do. And that really impedes the kind of acceptance that uh, John Crosby is talking about, that, that capacity to go in oneself and, and, and recollect. Okay. Now let's have some concrete examples because it's useful to think about this. Uh, Last, uh, a couple years ago, we had in the United States a terrible event in the city of Charlottesville. It was a neo-Nazi uh, parade demonstration. And in that parade, a young man took a car and he killed uh, a woman. He injured a lot of other people, but he killed this woman. Uh, and this gentleman was just convicted. And he got a sentence, life without the possibility of parole. He's in his 20s. I've met people in their 20s who are never going to get out of prison. <clears throat> Let's take another example. I taught a man who um, had six-week-old twins. He was uh, drug addicted, and his wife dropped his twins home, and he murdered them. And he stuck them underneath the bed. The police came to his home, and they were shocked to see his little feet sticking out from underneath the bed. A third example, sex offenders. I teach a lot of sex offenders. Sometimes they're actually the smartest people in the room. It's really a, a strange phenomena. People who have committed unspeakable acts against children. They can be philosophically inclined, philosophically. They say really interesting things. They're really disturbing. You get to know people at a, at a human level, and you just, you can, I, this guy did these horrible things, but he has these insights. It's, it's a really strange human experience. So let's think about these three cases. Um, these people are despised. I mean, despised. Who wants this, this neo-Nazi who killed this poor woman in Charlottesville? The man who killed his uh, own children, his wife, spoke it in, in our local newspaper a couple years ago and said, 
I hate him. Of course, I would hate somebody who killed my, my kids like that. I don't want to see any, I don't want any part of him. Sex offenders are the most despised in and outside of the prison. They have a, a permanent label. If you uh, commit a sex offense in this country, you get a permanent label, which is sex offender. On the sex offender registry, if you manage to get out of prison, you're going to live with that label for the rest of your life. I have met many people who have to struggle. They can't live in a certain area. They, I mean, just it's an absolute uh, nightmare. So think about the subjectivity of these human beings. Okay. What does it mean? Uh, some of them don't want to change, it seems to me. I always say seems. That's the operative term for me because there are surprises in life. There are surprises for me in a prison. I've been surprised. But some of these people don't want to change. And it's hard to know what's going to bring them to some kind of change. But other people are filled with a deep remorse, terrible remorse. They, come, they are awakened to their own crime. And they're in deep pain, and they want to, to change. Even if they're not going to get out of prison, it's not relevant. They are struggling with the crime that they have committed. But how can a person have the kind of acceptance that I just described from John Crosby? What does that mean? I mean, do I accept myself as a criminal? I am permanently a sex offender. And I go into myself and I recollect, what, what exactly does that mean? Or I have murdered my own children. How can I accept that? Or do I go beyond that? I some, somehow say, well, there's something else in me. There's something almost dishonest about that because you committed the crime. You can't get away and say, well, I, I have some deeper positive aspect of, self, of myself. I hope so. But so I want to explore what acceptance means in these kinds of contexts. I can't go into uh, deeper, but that's really the, one of the projects that I'm interested in here and uh, uh, writing about this in, in the future. Let me give an indication of how this might work. I, just, I have a sense of this. In our prison system, there's something called restorative justice. I have participated in this uh, practice. It tries to bring people together with victims or tries to bring the offender directly in contact with either the victim or the relatives of the victim. The kind of restorative justice that I participated in, the inmates sit around in a circle and they hear victims come forward and tell their story and it's extremely moving. And these inmates are often deeply troubled and moved by what they hear. The best kind of restorative justice, though, is this mediated, a mediation between the offender, victim, victim's relatives. If you're interested in this on YouTube, you can find this about eight weeks ago, 60 Minutes on CBS, did a program on restorative justice, and it featured some inmates in Wisconsin. And uh, I was deeply moved by this because I knew one of the inmates. I've known him for uh, almost 10 years. Um, and this young man came to our prison at age 17 in a man's prison, and it was very difficult for him, a 17-year-old in a prison of men. But he did our program, and he gradually uh, began to think about his crime, and he came to our chapel. I worship at our chapel, Catholic Mass, when I have the opportunity. I don't do it as much as I'd like to. And he asked to be baptized. And uh, it was, I was there. It was a beautiful moment where he was baptized. Then he asked to be received into the church, and he was received into the church. He finally managed to have this meeting with the relatives of his victims. And uh, you can hear the story, if you're interested, on, on, on 60 Minutes. It's an incredibly moving story. He's not getting out of prison. This is not a game. It's not trying to get parole. He finally, first of all, just admitted that he killed two people. He killed two elderly people. For years, he said, no, I, 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 was, I was there, but I didn't do it. He finally came to the truth of his own crime. Um, so I get a sense that there's something here that I want to I, I work on, that there's something here related to the stuff in personalism and uh, what John Crosby writes about, and then recollection. But I haven't quite uh, got there. I'm, I'm, I'm still getting there. Now, let me end here. Uh, I mean, why should you care about what I've said? Um, usually, I get reactions from people. You know, these people are revolting. 
I mean, why, why would we should care about a guy who can molest kids, or why should we care about someone who killed his own kids, or why should we care about that neo-Nazi in Virginia, let him rot in, rot in hell? And this is very understandable. Victims often feel this. It's deeply understandable. I mean, the, the, the woman who was killed in Virginia, um, she doesn't want anything to do with this guy. I mean, apologies aren't going to work. Apologies are an important way of uh, making things better. I'm sorry to you. That starts a process. But that's not going to work here. That woman in Virginia doesn't want to hear this guy apologize. Understandable. The woman who lost her twins doesn't want to apologize. Sex offenders is deeply problematic. If someone touched my children, I have twin boys, I would hurt them. I, I, I acknowledge that. It's not that we've talked about Socrates here. I know it would damage my own soul, but I would probably hurt them. They would have to stop me from doing so. So it, it, their apologies are really difficult to come by. And how do you kind of repair that relationship, that uh, broken relationship, and why should you bother? One of the reasons you should care is because the kind of people I'm talking about often fall into despair. Uh, Josef Pieper has a really interesting analysis of despair, and I included some of that readings in the text here. He talks about it as being a, uh, an anticipation of uh, non-fulfillment. Pieper talks about the human being on a journey. It's a beautiful concept that we're all on some kind of homo viator. We are all on some kind of a journey. And what happens when the person despairs is she sees her future as um, pointless. Everything's going to be bad. It's a deep kind of what he calls fundamental despair. That's a very interesting. And human beings fall into that despair. And I think we should care about this. We had an inmate who came to our prison. He was a sex offender, committed a terrible crime. And he finally realized he was in prison. He finally realized this was the end of the road. So he attacked some corrections officers, and he was put into solitary confinement. And he killed himself. This was just last year. Now again, people in our community were like, good, get rid of the guy. Uh, thank goodness, we don't want sex offenders. We should have executed him anyway. This is not an option for me. I am a personalist. I've written four books on the nature of human dignity. I believe in the ontological existence of dignity, that all persons have dignity. It's hard to see it sometime in the kind of people I'm talking about. I often struggle and try to understand how can I see the dignity in somebody who has molested children. But it is there. And ontologically, I think as personalists, we have to be committed to the idea that um, this uh, kind of dignity is inherent, inherent to the person. There's no, you can't take it away. They can't get rid of it no matter what they do. It's a, and, and I would say this is in keeping with the sense of the Imago Dei and, and so many other things. So that's not an option for me. And I want to end here with a plea that we pay attention to what's going on. Um, and think about hope in, in these kinds of extreme uh, contexts. We have 2.4 million people incarcerated in the United States, an extraordinary number. No other country in the world except North Korea or China uh, has anything like the prison system that we have. I've traveled overseas. I've been to prisons, other countries. Um, in terms of the numbers per capita, no comparison to the United States. And so. I want to make a plea that we pay attention to people who are locked up in the cages. The rest of their lives are going to be in a cage. I went to a prison eight weeks ago, and I visited these inmates in their cells, these tiny little cells. The kind of people I'm talking about are never going to get out of that cage. So I want to make a plea as personalists and as, as people who care about hope and, and the dignity of the person that this is something we ought to think about and, and pay attention to. So thank you very much. My reflections will be, will ultimately not just ask what is hope, but also what constitutes the moral value of hope and makes hope a virtue. First, we can say that hope is a very fundamental act of the person directed at future goods and goods which are in some way difficult to obtain, uh, where there are potential obstacles to obtaining them. For example, if we 
if we hope, if we say we hope that we will get a house and we have already the money to buy it in our pocket and enter the store to, to pay, then it would be not very appropriate to speak of hope because uh, as it were there, humanly speaking, there are no obstacles. The thing is already clear. But if we hope that we will recover from a, from a, from a great disease or sickness, then it is meaningful to speak of hope because it is, uh, no, it, there can be obstacles. We could also die and, and uh, so. So there must be some difficulty, some potential obstacles in the future good we hope for. And we can say that hope is a fundamental act of the human person because um, first of all, most of the goods that man desires lie in the future. And so hope is directed to goods which we do not yet possess. And we may say that through our temporal structure and then ultimately through our mortality, the most important goods for men lie in the future or in an eternal life in the future. Therefore, we may say with Gabriel Marcel, hope is the stuff of which the soul is made. And a, a human life without any hope would be a most inhuman and most uh, terrible life. As a matter of fact, uh, despair, which is the radical opposite of hope, would be, um, yeah, would be ultimately the ultimate despair would be kind of. Uh, Hell. So Dante describes hell as the as a life without any hope. Uh, he say he says uh, at the entrance door of the gates to hell, voi chi entrate lasciate ogni speranza. You who enter here uh, leave behind all hope. And so a human life in which there would be no hope for any future good would be the desperate life. Now, of course, there can be a form in which life, uh, human life would be, would no longer be, be, be inspired by hope because of the full possession of all good. So therefore, St. Paul says that faith will pass because if we see God, we don't need anymore to believe in him. And uh, hope will pass because if we are in the be eternal beatitude, we don't need to hope anymore. Only love will remain. But at any rate, as long as we live on earth, um, uh, we, we, uh, the, the, the future goods, uh, the most important future goods, um, are an object of hope. Because <laughs> if we, and in the fact that we, have to hope in these future goods um, it also reveals the fact that these future goods are not within our power. If we realize future goods, uh, goods which are in the future uh, that we can realize ourselves, then like washing dishes in our kitchen, <laughs> then we do not need to hope that the dishes will be washed because we can do it ourselves. But if we, for example, hope that Professor Crosby will wash my dishes in the kitchen, <laughs> then, then it's an object of hope <laughs> because then I do it not myself. <laughs> so we can say the more we, the more we are incapable of realizing these future goods ourselves to our own action, the more there's room for hope. Now we may also say that the hope that either John Henry or John Crosby will, will wash my dishes is sort of inappropriately called hope because it is a very low kind of good. And, and that there is a, <laughs> is a clean kitchen. And <laughs> I mean, it's not, so 
hope in its more significant senses refers to very great goods. Uh, we may say that the ultimate object of hope is an eternal good, an, un, uh, an indestructible good, uh, and not a good like the clean kitchen that in the next day when I have a new breakfast will again be dirty, and not a good that will, that of which we will be bereft by death, um, but rather a good that lasts. So we may say that hope ultimately is, is aiming at an eternal good, uh, at an immortal good, and not just as a good uh, at the end of which stands being deprived of it by death. So from that point of view, hope is a fundamental act of man insofar as if we analyze it in its depth, it aims not only at the many goods which will come and go, but at, as a lasting, at an eternal good. And of course, in the theological virtue of hope, uh, that is geared at the eternal good. Now, we may say that that good, in order to be a virtue, it cannot be just the hope that the kitchen will be cleaned for several reasons. First of all, the hope that is morally good, that is a virtue, presupposes that, that um, uh, we hope for the realization of a morally relevant good. Uh, if we, for example, hope to win a soccer game or that our nation will be, will be world champions in soccer, if the Germans hope that and the Austrian hope that they will not be the German, <laughs> then neither the hope of the Germans nor the hope of the Austrians are morally good. We may say, <laughs> we may say that this is a morally not relevant good, that, that the team wins the soccer game. Uh, nobody is virtuous because he hopes that uh, his national team will win the world championship. So also, if I hope that I win a game of chess, that's not morally good. Why? Because winning a game of chess, um, my will being directed at such a uh, success in a game is not uh, morally relevant. So we may say that hope uh, is, can only be a virtue to the extent to which its object is positively speaking, morally val valuable, has a value that is morally relevant. If my hope is aiming at a evil, for example, somebody hopes that his bank uh, robbery will be successful and he will walk away with millions of stolen uh, dollars, then his hope is morally evil because what he hopes for is in, has not only not a morally relevant value, but it has a disvalue. So we may say that uh, that hope to be a virtue or to be morally good requires that the object of this hope is m either morally good itself or <coughs> morally relevant. We may also say that that hope, um, in order to be morally good, requires that that well. We, we may distinguish, first of all, two kinds of hope. A hope that, that is not, so to speak, uh, directed uh, to another person, and a hope in a person. Like if we, uh, if in the religious sense, of course, it's the clearest case where uh, we say, in te domine speravi uh, numquam, uh, I will never be uh, put ashamed. I hope in you, O Lord, and I will never be put to shame or will never uh, be, uh, uh, well, be afflicted with evil. So this hope is uh, most clearly a hope in a person, and it not only recognizes that it's not within my power to realize the good, like when I hope to recover from my disease, but it is a hope that has set in another person, which, and in order for, for this hope to be justified, several conditions have to be met. First of all, the person in whom we set our hope must be morally good. It would be not of moral value to put my hope 
in a criminal uh, who is my my associate in in some business so the hope must for suppose that the other person has a true benevolence or is merciful or is good we cannot put our hope in the devil for example we can only put our hope in a good person and therefore the supreme hope the, the, the supremely justified hope is to put one's hope in a, a divine infinitely good person but the hope uh, has also to fulfill the condition that the person in whom in whom we if we speak of the hope in a person the hope in whom we place our trust and, pers and our hope must be uh, powerful enough to give us the good which we desire. So we, if we set our hope, uh, um, if both John Crosby and I are in prison by the communists and threatened by being killed, and then we hope in each other to be freed, that's not very reasonable because neither I nor he has any power to escape from the prison or to, to, to achieve freedom. Therefore, in order to be rational and also in order to be a virtue, hope has to, the hope in a person has to be hope in a person who has enough power to, to give us the good we hope for. And um, so we may say that in the third condition, for the hope in a person to be good, morally good, is that we have some evidence or some knowledge that this person is trustworthy, is worthy of our hope. For example, if we put all our hope in a very unreliable other person who has often disappointed us, often de deceived us, who is very fluctuating in his intentions and will, then it's unreasonable, uh, this hope. And it, if we put our hope in a trusted friend who, who, who has the power to free us from prison, maybe a very, if, if my friend John Crosby is a powerful king who can simply by his word open the gates of my prison in which I am unjustly uh, imprisoned, then that is uh, reasonable. Uh, it's reasonable be not only because he has the power and because he's good, but also because I have good rational reasons to trust that he will do his best to, to use his power for my good. Um, if I, if I um, have, um, we can say, uh, and if, ha if I know, have no good reason to put my trust in another person, then one can ask whether it's a virtue, whether it's rather, uh, rather mad and whether it's un quite unreasonable. If I, if I put my hope in a person uh, of whom I have no, no good reason, no evidence that he is good. What? You spoke half an hour, and now you want that I speak only <laughs> 10 minutes? <laughs> I'm, chair of the, I'm chair of this, and we need to allow for questions. So. Uh, what? I'm, I'm, we need to allow for some questions. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> needs to speak yeah, yeah, but you spoke half an hour and you yeah. stopped me after 15 minutes. The chair doesn't mean well, uh, omnipotent. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, chair must still oh, be yeah. obey yeah. the laws of like justice I'm and equality. I'm out of time, okay? <laughs> okay, well. Uh, the chair will allow you five more minutes. Five more minutes. <laughs> okay. At any rate, um, the chair, uh, see what, uh, what here chair means. <laughs> okay. I, I have a little reason to put my hope in the, in the chair. <laughs> at, at any rate, I hope that there would be equal, equal rights for each speaker. But anyway. Uh, I will, I will try to come to a conclusion. Um, there, is, there is one very important contribution to, to the philosophy and also to the theology of hope that we find in Karl Wojtyla, and I wrote this also a separate paper on Karl Wojtyla's philosophy of hope. Beca and that is that normally, and in, in St. Thomas's description of the reasons why 
Hope is a lesser virtue than love. It is understood that hope hopes for our own objective good, that hope is directed for the good for the person, and that is to say for the good of our own person. And so it is not as transcendent, not as self-giving, not as noble as love, says St. Thomas, because lo the love of God loves God for his own sake, whereas the hope sees in God only our supreme good. And um, I would say that, that this um, may find or has found some kind of correction and an important co addition in the philosophy of Carl, in the philosophy of hope of Karl Wojtyla, because one can ask why should hope only be directed at my good? Why should I not be able to hope also for the future good of another person, of a loved person? And so if uh, hope is connected with love, we may say that hope uh, can equally, uh, much equally intensely, hope for the good uh, and the eternal good of other persons whom I love. And in that way, we can say the, the moral goodness of love and the moral goodness of hope are intimately connected. And in a lecture I gave on Hillebrand's uh, seventh chapter of the Nature of Love book, which is on the benevolence of love, on the, on the intensio benevolentiae of love, then there I think we can see that, that, the, that it is of the nature of love to desire the objective good for the other person whom we love. And so I think hope also should not be a kind of ego-centered act in which we desire or hope for our own uh, good, but it should also with equal intensity hope for the good of other persons uh, whom we love. And, uh, our, and, and if somebody only hopes for his own eternal good but not hopes for that of other persons, uh, it would be a very imperfect kind of hope kind of a self-centered hope uh, and a, a hope uh, divorced from, from love. Now I see that my chair is starting to frown. <laughs> and so so I, will, I will stop here and leave the rest for a discussion. I wanted to elaborate more on uh, Gabriel Marcel on hope, of which I gave you a few pages in the reader. Uh, he's a little different in some ways in that, you know, uh, deeper on hope and von Hildebrand's treatise on his chapter on hope in the art of living and for Tiwan hope, they have this wonderful uh, clarity and understandability as you go through them. And Marcel, of course, has these moments of incredible insight, pages of incredible insight, but, but linked together with sort of all the musings and highways and byways his mind went through to get there. And he wants it that way. He doesn't want to leap too far into pure clarity for fear you leave behind the complex mess out of which the insight came. And so I'm gonna to try to clarify, but he might not think that's the greatest thing. Now he himself admits this. He, I opened my treatise, say, or the selections from his uh, treatise saying, perhaps we can now feel authorized to formulate a few general propositions <laughs> to sum up most of the observations we've been able to make in the course of our all too winding journey. And he wants you to wind with him to stay close to experience, but I'm gonna lift out a number of points. I'm gonna to try to give a uh, couple of dozen brief little perspectives, like spotlights that will help clarify hope versus despair. Uh, a series of one-liners that I hope will clarify and not do injustice to myself. First, hope, uh, a few points on hope compared to optimism or pessimism. Hope, as has been said, is in a person who can help with his power and goodness, whereas optimism, like pessimism, is more a psychological tendency within me. And so hope is realistic. It doesn't try to downplay the obstacles. It faces and acknowledges the obstacles and the obstacles and threats, but in light of help from above, Whereas a mere optimism can easily become unrealistic if you have to try to downplay the difficulties to keep up your positive attitude. 
Hope has then a transcendent source and an openness in us to that source, whereas optimism or pessimism are more self-enclosed. In hope, as Dr. Seifert pointed out, the person hoped in is at the center of the whole act, whereas in optimism or pessimism, the event longed for is at the center of things. And so hope, again, to use a sort of a, a key <coughs> distinction that Marcel likes, hope involves more of a mystery of something supra-rational. Optimism and pessimism are more on the level of a problem, a level of rationality. Now, um, to compare hope with despair, I want to open up with a little image that, that fits a bit also uh, with the solitary confinement image, although I came up with this independently. I, I, I think of hope as lying in a sleeping bag looking up at the stars, and of despair as lying in a coffin with the lid closed. And if you want to be more communal about hope, you could be lying in that sleeping bag with your beloved, looking up at the stars and thinking about the future. So a couple of, they're not perfect images, but they'll do. And so to start a comparison of those, I would say hope involves a certain humility because you're willing to receive help from another. Despair involves a certain presumption because you're there for your own self, your own wishes, or else nothing. So hope involves a spiritual vitality. Uh, hope overcomes, but not by my strength. Uh, whereas in despair, there's a temptation to go to pieces or give up or capitulate to fate. In hope, you hold on to your true self. You take a position about yourself. You safeguard your own integrity. Whereas in despair, there's a temptation to accept and anticipate uh, your own self-destruction and even help bring it about with your, your attitude. In hope, there is a positive non-acceptance of closedness. So you remain, you may hope, you're not revolting, but you're not accepting the idea that all doors are closed. Whereas in despair, there's a danger that fear and panic will predominate, that there's no way out. In hope, then, there can be a certain attitude of patience with yourself, with your situation, with others. Um, which reminds me of Von Hildebrand's marvelous chapter in uh, Transformation in Christ on holy patience. Uh, whereas in despair, there's an impatience with the fact that what you want isn't coming when you want it. Uh, and there can then be a danger of rejecting what Von Hildebrand calls God as the Lord of time. And, and then a danger of violence, if things aren't happening the way you want, of breaking out violence. In hope, then, there can be a kind of a peace. Uh, the English translator even uses the word relaxation, but I thought peace was a little better. Uh, because you acknowledge that these kinds of trials and difficulties are part of the drama of life with others and with God. It's part of a whole drama uh, with, with God. Uh, you're not alone here, and, and, and you're not abandoned. Whereas in despair, uh, the person can become increasingly uptight, tense, anxious, worried. Uh, so what hope does is allow you to detach yourself from the cramp of, of an inner determinism. Whereas despair is crippling and can become a sort of a false fascination dragging you down. Uh, so hope is fluid and open indirectly because of the hope and hope the person hoped in. Uh, whereas despair anticipates negative re repetition. It anticipates closedness and a dead end. Uh, so in hope, you see oneself as a flame meant to face events and continue to grow and develop and endure. Whereas in despair, there's more a longing for self-annihilation not as a solution, but as a kind of a final outrage. And so there's a tendency to turn on oneself, be self-consumed, <clears throat> not acknowledge any growth or positive possibilities. So hope involves, as Dr. Seifert again said, love and trust. Uh, whereas despair uh, does not involve love and trust, neither does optimism or pessimism, but much less despair. In hope, 
the imagined event or the longed for event is not the essence, but the person hoped in, as we said earlier. Whereas in despair, you're focusing only on your desires and resenting the conditions, snuffing it out. Uh, so in hope, there is a certain freedom, flexibility. The, the, the word suppleness is used by Marcel. Uh, whereas in despair, you feel this overwhelming determinism of being boxed in. Uh, to use another uh, interesting comparison of uh, being and having in, in Marcel, in hope, you're being with another in communion and therefore with a certain confidence and security, uh, whereas in despair, uh, you're setting limits on what you would consider a solution. So you're trying to possess and control and have things the way you want. Hope then involves a free decision to trust and despair a free decision to refuse that, even if you offer deterministic excuses. Hope then involves the fundamental response of a creature to the absolute being, to whom we owe everything and should set no conditions. It's the proper response of the creature. Whereas Marcel says despair is like an act of treason saying that God has withdrawn from me, which would never be justified, even in conditions like that of Job in the Old Testament or Joseph sold into Egypt. They're the more positive patterns. Um, hope involves acceptance, but not apathy, uh, uh, rather a deeply caring, you're still deeply caring about you hope, what you hope for, but the, a deeply caring acceptance of God's will. Whereas despair involves a, an attempt to not care in a way, to, to sort of fall into meaninglessness and consequent resentment and hatred. So love, I mean, uh, hope involves loyalty based in love and reciprocal communion. Uh, despair involves disloyalty. Hope involves uh, also being a witness to others, a, a deep bond between us. Uh, Marcel captures this communal aspect that Joseph brought out with Wojtyla with his phrase, I hope in thee, with a capital T, hope in thee for us. And so you can think of someone like Maximilian Kolbe entering into the starvation bunker and helping the other nine people through their death. Uh, so a witness to others and a deep positive bond, whereas despair drags others down uh, like a contagion, like a disease. Uh, Alice von Hildebrand was popularly uh, says, um, uh, disease is catching, health is not. You have to work through things to get to the positive. Now hope, however, uh, is not pretentious or defiant of reality, uh, as some might think, well, they, they want a miracle, miracles don't happen, blah, blah, blah. It's not denying reality or assuming what's impossible because it's grounded in God, uh, as long as you're not asking for something literally impossible. <coughs> um, so it's not pretentious or defiant against reality. It doesn't deny the evils, whereas despair uh, hardens itself against the positives in life, against values, against the sources or clues toward hope. Uh, despair then is unrealistic. So hope is, is silent and modest. Despair is cynically self-assertive and uh, an area where human calculation reigns supreme. Uh, Marcel says that the man who hopes is timid about himself his attitude is powerful only because grounded in God. Whereas in despair, you say, even God can't help me. My problem is bigger than God. Uh, in hope, you're open to new creative action or possibilities, even if you don't see how, because that's God's business, how you'll be helped. It's not yours. Uh, whereas in despair, you're closed off to transcendence. In hope, we find time opening up toward eternity and transcendence. In despair, we find time as a closed system imprisoning me. 
In hope, you await the gift. You don't chain the giver. Uh, whereas in despair, you demand a solution in my way and in my time. Uh, and therefore, hope is not a bargaining with God, but a total self-gift, putting yourself completely in his hands. Whereas despair might originally tend to start out saying, well, I'll follow you, I'll accept you if you do this for me, reversing the priorities. And then if God doesn't do it the way you want and when you want, you use that disappointment to accuse him. So obviously hope is open to God and to others. You hope for others, not just for yourself. Uh, whereas despair is closed off in a self-consuming, dizzying descent, a kind of a vertigo. Hope involves then, another key comparison in Marcel, hope involves availability, uh, disponibilité, that is the capacity for self-giving and service whereas despair involves egolatry, you're clogged up with yourself. And so ultimately hope is an obligation and a virtue. Uh, you're called to trust in God who deserves that trust. Uh, but hope, like love, can be rejected. Uh, whereas despair involves rebellion and sin. Despair over oneself includes despair of God. And despair, like hatred, can be chosen. And so hope can be seen as a continual foundation for human life, uh, which after all, and Marcel likes to point this out, uh, human life after the fall is itself a trial and a captivity. And so hope is foundational every day of our lives, not just in times of acute, <coughs> acute crisis. Uh, whereas, uh, similarly, despair is also an ever-present temptation in our life in this world. And so something we have to fight against every day. All right.